and thank to all of you who've joined us. We have a, a nice, we have 87 people signed up today. That's a nice, a nice uh, a group of people from uh, the UK and various parts of the world. Uh, our topic today is, is an exciting one, I think, it, particularly in the US right now, in other parts of the world with mass incarceration, with, with efforts now to downsize our incarceration, there are going to be more and more people re-entering society from prison and we need really some much more imaginative and more resource rich approaches to that than we've had. And so our topic today uh, are the program, an approach that Lauren and her colleagues, Lauren Walker and her colleagues, have pioneered it is a restoratively oriented uh, use of reentry planning circles. And so they're going to be telling us about this today. Um, and I will introduce them here briefly. Uh, what happened to Lauren? There's Lauren. Lauren is a uh, public health educator and a restorative lawyer. She is a lawyer, uh, calls herself, like others do, a uh, restorative lawyer. I like that. She's been a lecturer at the community college there in Hawaii, trained, interestingly enough, as a Montessori teacher. It'd be interesting to know, Lauren, what you, how that's contributed to your approach. <laughs> uh, Lauren and others have developed this reentry circle model. Uh, and that's what we're going to be hearing about today. And they have published a lot of material. Uh, there's some of it listed here, and we will be posting with the with the webinars to other links. Uh, but they've they've written a lot, and they've been willing to share a lot, and that's really helpful to other communities who want to do this. Uh, also, with her, Ian Crab. Ian is a licensed electrician who participated in one of their early one of their first reentry circles, where while he was in prison for drug related crimes. Uh, he spent three years in prison and then feels like the circle really enabled him to make amends and reestablish relationships and helped him become a caregiver for his father. Um, his, his convictions were pardoned by the governor and now he's been part of these circles, a number of these circles, and he's trained to become a circle facilitator. So we're really, really pleased to have you here Ian, as well. So topic is reentry circles, and Lauren and Ian are going to take it from here. I'm going to stop sharing my uh, PowerPoint so that you can pick it up from here. Okay, great. I'm just looking for the PowerPoint. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Ian, um, why don't you start talking about how we met? Good evening, everybody, everyone. Um, I was incarcerated for about three years for drug-related crimes, and it was just a lifestyle about 20 years leading up to my incarceration. It wasn't just the drugs, my behavior, drugs compounded everything. And towards the end of my sentence, I was at a therapeutic community called Cashbox, a minimum security. I earned the right to be there uh, about my third year of incarceration, and uh, we we learned many things, uh, choices, decisions. That's what they, they taught us uh, that uh, enabled me to, 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 to discover that. I was ready to learn. And what, at, towards the end of my uh, incarceration, I, I had a wonderful counselor who really cared for me and uh, uh, other men. And I really thought we would make it in, in society getting out because we lived together. I was there for 14 months. And... Uh, I got introduced to Lauren. He put Mr. Kalama put me on the side and said, Mr. Crab, we address everybody's Mr. in there. Yeah? Mr. Crab, we, we want you to uh, try this restorative justice circle classes and it'll prep you up to hopefully make amends in your family, and which is precious to me to this day. And, and when it came to that, I got to meet Lauren and Kat Brady and Diane and uh, learning skills, more skills. and. Then I got, then Lauren asked me if I wanted to participate in the circle, restore to just a circle with my family. And I was so afraid because I haven't heard from them in a few years. And I was afraid, but I, I learned to face my fears, which I was trained to do. And it worked out real good. I was so nervous in, in all things. And, and Lauren set it up where she got between me and my father and my brothers. and. Uh, got, got, a contact, got a hold of them, contact, and tell them what we're going to do. And they, they actually came up to the prison where I was at. 
And when I felt so nervous, yeah, and because I wanted to say sorry and uh, ask for forgiveness because I wanted to make things right with my family, who I miss so much. And being off of drugs, uh, it, it was so, the thinking is so, so much clarity, more clearer. And I, got, I was ready to learn in that therapeutic community. And this was the epitome of everything. It topped everything off. It was much joy. And the reward was so great that when we had to restart the circle, the warden was there. Lauren, Cap, Brady, Diane, and my two brothers and my father were uh, for about four hours, four or five hours. I got, and my, my counselors were there and three of my good friends so they could witness what went on. And I was so, so nervous and afraid still, but um, I, I cried my heart out for about four hours and, and sincerely right by my father just said, I'm so sorry not. Not because he did that. I'm so sorry for my whole life, not just in prison, my whole life being prideful, arrogant, and we were spoiled growing up. And uh, I, I finally grew up at 42 years old, and I got to uh, make amends with my family. And it was, it was a precious thing to me. And I'll never, uh, my family fell in love with me again, and I got to start my new life again. So at, at my age of 42 at the time, and it was a wonderful experience. Because because I got to be with them. And, and literally all the way, I, I told my father, I'll be with you to the end. And literally, it, it took, he passed away. I took care of him at home. Uh, on top of that, uh, everything was so professional that they, everybody, uh, Lauren and Kat, and, I, and they wrote th good things about me, potential things about me, little bit things of the past, but more, more, more emphasizing to what a good person I am. And, you know, I felt, you know, eaten down all these years, yeah, with drugs and all that, but I knew where I was going in the direction where I was going to start my new life again, and this restorative justice circle, reality uh, circle got me right where it was, it was so perfect timing that um, I was ready and my family was ready to it. it I, I know, I, that's why I come and still help Lauren and any way I can to help that, 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 that person, individual to come to. Yeah. So precious to me. Okay, um, yeah, so Ian, when Ian first learned about it, we, besides the reentry circles, we do a cognitive behavioral course that when we first thought of the idea of having the reentry circles, we went to a local prison here, and the warden at the time is a wonderful man named Ted Sakai, who was also the head of our whole prison department in Hawaii uh, in the past. And, but at the time, he was the warden of this Waiava prison. And um, so we, we had the idea of the circle, a re-entry circle developing it. And, um, but the, the staff at the prison, the one that um, Ian was just talking about, Sai Kalama, this program called Cashbox. It's a, it's a therapeutic drug rehabilitation program. And they, uh, the counselors there asked if we would do a class, a cognitive class for the people in the prison to teach them how to uh, facilitate, to, to um, learn about emotional intelligence. So we did that, and um, Ian was a member of that class, and that's how he learned about the reentry circles that we're gonna talk about right now. And uh, so that they're provided by, um, they were developed by a small nonprofit that I work with called the Hawaii Friends of Restorative Justice, formerly the Hawaii Friends of Justice and Civic Education. Um, the process was developed by also helped me was um, Insu Kim Berg, who was my teacher. She was a founder. She was a fabulous um, therapist and founder, a co-founder of the Solution Focused Brief Therapy process, which is a lot like motivational interviewing, except it does not have the stages of change. Uh, solution focused brief therapy assumes people can change if they say they want to and it doesn't you don't assess them uh, so the reentry circles they're voluntary they're provided for individuals in prison parole probation and we've done all of those provided them but mostly we have done them for people in prison uh, the the process is rooted in public health principles where it's goal oriented there's an interactive group process and it's strength based and Howard this actually my Montessori training comes into play here I I learned I'm actually I'm a high school dropout I only finished the ninth grade of high school but I took a Montessori teacher training course 
when I was 18 and became a Montessori. I completed it when I was 19 and became a Montessori teacher when I was 19. And so since then, I'm 63 now, I've always had this Montessori approach to learning. And it's very much like public health education where uh, the people participate in inactive learning. It's a, a lot of it too is um, supported by social social psychology principles, Albert Bandura, Ellen Langer, all kinds of people um, also apply these kinds of principles. So the reentry process itself is kind of a marriage between restorative justice and solution focused approach, which I think both of them are, are follow public health learning principles. And so we apply both of those approaches together. The, the first step of the process, the beginning of the process, the pre-circle process, where as most people know who do facilitation, this kind of work, the work is always before the meeting. And um, so the process is described to people, what it's like. We have a brochure that talks about it. Um, we provide applications for people. The application is provided to the prison, and then the prison sends them to us. And then we schedule an interview. We go meet with the person in prison or um, on parole or probation. And uh, we do, we provide a solution focused interview. So it's very, the solution focused approach is very optimistic. It's super optimistic. The only kind of assessment we do is a, it's a surface assessment right then. We don't do, there, there's a, um, there's a specific endeavor to not know a lot about people's histories. You don't, we don't do any kind of a big historical assessment. In solution-focused brief therapy, there's no pathology. Everything is just right now, it's very um, present tense, and what is good about what's going well for people right now is pointed out to them. And so it's a very uplifting interview. People, we have seen uh, people come in very downtrodden, you know, they're in prison, they have on their uniform and um, they feel a lot of shame. But as we talk to them very optimistically, like what, wow, you want to have a circle, you're interested in this, uh, you, you want to be accountable. And the people just become a lot more optimistic and they leave with their heads up. So we had this nice interview. Uh, we do tell them to at the interview, only about 30% of the people who apply for these actually get them because we are strapped for resources. We hardly, we're, we really run on a, a shoestring. Um, uh, so anyway, and we tell them the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So if you really want to circle, keep uh, bother, you know, keep contacting us about it. So, um, so we had this interview, it takes about 45 minutes. And then um, we also ask them who their supporters are, who do they care about, who do they think cares about them, who do they want to make amends with, that kind of thing. And um, we, they give us all their phone numbers are on the um, interview application. And then after we get to have that, uh, we begin to try and convene the circle and call, call the people that they have invited. And like Ian said, and I remember too, specifically Ian's case, because he was one of our very first people to have a circle 10 years ago. I think you were the third, third person to have a circle. And uh, families are, they really, if a third party comes to them and says, you know, your son is, um, it wants to be accountable, he wants to try and make amends and wants to make a plan for a positive future. Are you interested in coming and meeting with them? And um, the people are a lot more, I think, open to hearing from worse some third party, you know, and it's, uh, we don't have really a, um, we're not biased, you know, so anyway, the people are more interested. We have had some people say no, that they don't want to participate, which we really respect and don't try to pressure anyone uh, to participate. But we do tell people, do you want us to call you back? Do you want to think about it? We can call you back, we'll mail you an, uh, a brochure about the process. And a lot of times we have had those people want to have circles. So we convene the circle and then we have these and we call shuttle participants, which are people, Hawaii is an island, you know, it's a chain of islands. People, and as everybody knows, the people in prison are mostly disenfranchised poor people. So they don't have money to pay for transportation to come to a circle. And sometimes people have to work and sometimes people are sick. 
And so we are able to ask the person by telephone the same kind of questions, the same questions that we would ask during a real circle. And so we can gather that information. And then when we have the circle, we have an empty chair and we have that person's information. And that has proven to be very powerful for people. The process is it's guided by the facilitator, but it's really driven by the incarcerated person. It, it, the solution focused approach is, is totally goal based and, and strength based. It's really about what people want instead of talking about what you don't like about yourself and uh, what's wrong. It's about what's good and what do you want? What do you want? The, the way it's driven by the person, it begins right off the bat by giving the whoever has the circle, the individual, they open it in any personally meaningful way. And so um, it, it respects people's uh, values, their culture. We have had um, prayer. I can't remember. How was yours open? We opened up with a prayer. With a prayer, yeah. And we had, uh, I remember we had a haka one time. Someone at the, oh, really? at, the nice. at, at the prison, Ian was at, did a haka. It's a Hawaiian uh, chant where I think three or four men, they do this really powerful chant. Um, so anyway, it's opened up however the individual wants it. They share, the participants share what they like about the person, what are the person's strengths, and if the person has children, if they've brought their children to the circle, we always say that your children are your strengths too, and what are the children's strengths? And this is just a really lovely aspect of this process where children, it's so great. They're sitting with their grandparents, their aunties, uncles, their parents, and they're hearing all these adults say what they like about them. And I can't tell you how many times it makes me cry, but the kids are so thrilled to hear all these nice things and it's all being recorded, written down. So that's a really nice piece of the process. And then the individual shares what their proudest accomplishments have been since they've been in prison or on probation or parole. We ask them what, you know, what have you done? And it's always, it's stuff like got a GED, took a class, want to be accountable. It's very positive. And that's a, a real solution focused question that um, Insu Kimberg made sure it was used in this process. Uh, the individual identifies their goals, how they want their future to be different from their past. Sometimes people get, we try not, don't, we don't say goal right away because people get kind of nervous about that. Like, I don't know my goals, you know? So Insu like to say it like this, you know, how do you want your future to be different from your past? And they plan for a positive life in the community. And it's, it's planning. And this is what a person said who had a circle. They said it's not just talking. It's planning for the future that really helped. And it really does. It makes, it helps people. I think it's really good role modeling for everyone to plant, to make plans. There's this really good book by, I think his name is Michelson. And it's um, learning to plan, planning to learn. And planning is really helpful, and especially for young people, all of us. So these are the needs it addresses, the circle. It specifically addresses reconciliation first. We look at that first as the first need. And, and when we say reconciliation, we do not necessarily mean a reconciled relationship with people, but coming to terms. We mean coming to terms with what happened. And I'll just put this in really quick. We have had a couple circles for people who did not commit the crimes that they were imprisoned for. They were imprisoned under the color of law. The state did convict them under the color of law, under the laws, but the people were innocent. And um, so they've been able to reconcile with that misjustice that happened to them. And then otherwise, the bulk of the cases are people who did do, who did hurt people and do want to make amends and they do want to come to terms with what they did. So sometimes reconciliation can result in a repaired relationship, which is the ideal quintessential restorative process outcome, but it is not always, it's not the absolute driver when we talk about reconciliation here. The other needs after we do reconciliation, which takes the most time in the circle, they're, they're planned for three hours. 
and that does take most of the time, right? And the reconciliation. I do remember Ian <clears throat> crying. Five hours, yeah. yeah and, Five Ian's, hours. and I remember Four. Ian's dad had his hand on his your knee, and, and I remember Cat Brady and I both crying. Um, it was really a touching. It was very touching, and. And um, so after we do reconciliation, um, the people, they talk about their housing, their basic needs for a successful law-abiding life. And it's, it's all of these things, housing, education, financial, their, their documents, uh, transportation, physical health, emotional health is really important. A lot of times people don't think about their, what do you do to maintain good emotional health? This has actually been helpful for me too to think about what you know. What do I need? It, it really helps you to 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 witness people processing these things. Another thing that we added since um, I've studied the work of Allison Link in on the East Coast of the U.S. is le leisure time use. How do you use your leisure time? Which is often Allison works with people in prisons, and that's often uh, a big problem for people who get into drugs and stuff. Is their use of leisure time. They haven't really ever thought about it. Um, but they also identify their supporters in the circle. And so the reconciliation piece, this is how it goes. It's um, typical Howard Zare. It's um, who was harmed by past behavior and or your imprisonment. How were they harmed? We asked this of the individual having the circle first. And then after they share, the, we asked the other participants there who the individual inevitably has identified as someone who was harmed. We asked them to share how they were harmed and what the person can do to help repair that harm. The, and then the individual we asked, do you agree to these things? And of all the cases we've done so far, about 135, I think, no one, only one person has said no. They didn't want to do it, and it was a young man. His sisters, I will never forget, his sisters came from California to this circle for him at Wyava, and they wanted him to stop drinking. And he said, no, I'm not going to quit drinking. I'm not going to lie to you. And, and they kept trying to pressure him. And then um, finally, it just I was like, wow, well, you're really honest. You're really honest about you're not going to quit drinking. And... So the, and he didn't stop drinking and he, and I ended up talking to the sisters a few years later in an evaluation and he did end up in prison, but they had a very, the attitude of the sisters was, well, you know, maybe he still learned, they had hope that he was figuring things out for himself. But, and yeah, so we try not to pressure people to, to agree to things they don't want to do. The, we've done 134 circles, men, women for adults and youth. And we've had 581 participants. It always includes uh, loved ones, friends, and also staff from the institution, the prison, or someone on parole or probation always participates too. The, to date, they unanimously, all of these people, 100% have found that the process was positive, that they thought that the process was positive. And uh, the participants have said, we give them a, a pretty nice one-page uh, survey, and they consistently believe that it's, it increased the, the individual in prison, their social support, and that it helped them repair their relationship with the person. And this is really interesting. We looked at people who relapsed and who became reincarcerated a few years ago. Rebecca Greening and I, who's she's in she's in Boston now, and uh, Rebecca and I looked at who who relapsed, who is back in prison, and these people had all said that the process was positive when they first had the circle. Now, what do they think some years later after the person has gone back to prison? And we found we talked. I remember it was seven families we talked to. And they all still said, yes, it was very positive, very beneficial for them, despite the fact that their loved one was back in prison. They still thought the process was healing and helpful for them, and they were glad that they did it. Uh, we did also look at, tried to look at some recidivism, and we found just, it, we had a small number of people, like, we only looked at 
about, I think, 20 or 20, 25 people or 27 people who had had a circle within two to six years earlier. And uh, we just found some promise. You know, it wasn't a big, it wasn't a big enough sample to really look at recidivism. And uh, here's our websites if you want to look at papers. We have a lot of papers on this process. The hawaiifriends.org website has them and also my website, laurenwalker.com. And we do have a small, we have this little book, this little book about um, circles, uh, reentry transition planning circles. It's like a little handbook, walks people through the process. So that's, I think that that is... Oh, yeah. And it's being replicated right now. The process is being replicated in upstate New York at, I think it's Monroe <coughs> County Jail, a woman's jail. And they also have done an evaluation. And so it's being replicated there. And then also in California with uh, probationers in California. And in Washington, D.C., Penny Griffith, my colleague in Washington, D.C., she uh, is in the Columbia Heights area, and she's doing the circles, too. And all these people have a different name. They call it something else uh, to fit with their culture. And Penny is calling it Healing Circles in D.C., her organization, the Columbia Collaborative, I believe, the name of her organization. And uh, so, yeah, people can contact me uh, for any information, I'm happy to share our papers and any information. We're really open to helping people with this work if they're interested. Oops. Sorry to turn this off, right? Okay, are you ready? Ready for some questions? <coughs> Are you uh, are you ready for some some questions here? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. yeah, we're ready. Can you see this? <laughs> Maybe yeah. I should. Uh, yeah, you want to? You can leave your screen up with one of the powerpoints if you want to, or you can just close it down by going to the to the uh, stop sharing button. Oh, okay. So does that stop sharing mean we're not? On, do you want us yeah, to be it on means it? Your, it means your your screen won't be up. Right now, we're seeing your your safari. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. There okay, sorry. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry about that. If I can get mine back up here, and then I have some questions here. So I share screen. Let's see here. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Well, good. We've got questions coming in here. Uh, I've got questions too, but I'm. Let me ask a, a couple of questions of my own, and then start on the questions that are coming in. Does the circle, is it a one-time event or does it ever reconvene or meet more than once? Yes, it reconvenes at the participant's choice. They, that's one of the, uh, at the end of the circle, we say, do you want to have another circle? If you do want to have another circle, when do you want it? So it's left up to the participants. It's really driven by them, what they okay. want. Okay, well, then let me start. There's, there's one long question that's very general. I'm going to leave that one for a little while here. But here's one question from Paris. Does the decision to take part in a reentry circle have an impact upon probation and the prison's willingness to release a prisoner into the community? Does it affect the release date? Uh, not officially. I think they would say the people who work in the uh, probation would say no, but I think it does personally. I think that it helps people. One time, actually, when we first started this process, the head of the um, our parole board named um, Mr. Tofono, is that his Albert name? Tofono. Albert Tofono. We were at a legislative hearing talking about the reentry circles at a legislative hearing, a Hawaii state legislative hearing. And Mr. Tofono stood up and said, oh, yeah, we've had those people come before us to the parole board, and they really do well. It's amazing how they've uh, become accountable and want to change and so he spoke very highly of it but, but I think officially they would say oh no you know how it is but I mean I think it it seems like they have a lot of potential to be part of a probate a release plan yes part of that I agree planning. yeah but. yeah we're doing that right now with our federal court we're doing a pro, pro, uh, uh, pilot with our federal court um, well, it's like a, it's for people who are actually going into prison. 
and they make a plan when they go in. They go in. Yeah. Entry plan right at the beginning of going into prison. And I think it's really valuable. It helps people do better prison time. I think if you can have one, it helps you do better time in prison. You've um, hopefully repaired some relationships with people and have that support while you're in there and the other things that you develop, the other plans. Yeah, that makes sense. I've heard of a number of programs using kind of a family group or circle process yeah. going into prison to get yeah. as well as coming out. Okay, yeah. another one. Uh, Elan, Elena says, this is fantastic. My question is practical. Are there formal rounds of the circle or just the first topic? What are the strengths? And then a facilitative dialogue. Who facilitates the dialogue? In other words, tell us about the process itself uh, and how it's facilitated. Sure, okay. Okay, well, yeah, we do have a, like an agenda. It's not really um, totally, it's not like a scripted thing. You know, it's not a scripted process, but there are steps. And so the person opens the facility. We sit in a circle. There's no um, table or anything. Everybody sits together in a circle. And then the facilitator reminds usually the person having a circle to open it, that they have to open it. You know, no one will talk until they say something. So they open it. Then the facilitator says the purpose is to help, uh, you know, thank the people for coming. And then I think they uh, say who they are. Everyone says who they are and their relationship to the individual. And then um, the purpose of it is to help him make a plan for the future and to repair harm as much as he can. And then, then we start by asking what, what, first we ask, what are you most proud of that you've accomplished since you've been in prison? So it starts off in a real optimistic place. And then after they say what they're most proud of, then we go around and ask people, what do you like about him? And if his children are there, first we do the children. What do you like about Sean? What do you like about Sean? What are his strengths? And, um, and then the person having the circle, we go over his strengths. And then it always ends. We always end. Sometimes people say this as a strength. They say the person is accountable and responsible for themselves. There's a... And that was the thing, um, everyone, that it was a nervous when I went and I'm what I do this and uh, the race the help of steered me in the right direction and it was so perfect how it's it, it set up in the design where I, I could just answer what I could because I was still optimistic about oh I don't know how they're going to think and those, those kind of fears are going in my mind but it was still so perfect that and gentle that my, my family could open up and, and get a little bit trust in there which I, which I wanted there was so much things I wanted and it's up to them, but it was just a perfect design for me and for forgiveness and you know, all loving each other again and the healing process of the things I've done. And Okay, and you spend enough time in prison. We want to hear you out now. And uh, I'm, I'm forever grateful. And I, I'm, I've lived with people where we're off drugs for a few years and we're thinking I live with them that my brothers are incarcerated brothers and they want to do that too. And you can see the true person in there. But a lot of people, they're salvageable. They're salvageable. They need to be loved. And I, I I still can keep in contact with friends to this day. How are you doing this and that and stuff like that, Lori? I just have to add that in there. Yeah, thanks. Thank direction. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so it's very optimistic. It's solution-focused. It really is a solution-focused approach, looking at the positive and how can you get more of that. And uh, when problems do come up in the solution-focused approach, we always look for the exceptions to the problems. When doesn't this problem happen? What are you doing when this doesn't happen? Uh, we also use scaling questions, like on a scale of one to 10, how, you know, if a person says they're gonna stay clean and sober, well, how, you know, you probably said you were gonna stay clean and sober before, how come this time is different? On a scale of one to 10, where are you? You know, one, you're gonna relapse, 10, you're gonna stay clean. Where are you, honestly, realistically, on that scale, right now as you sit here, where are you? Where is your confidence that you're going to be able to remain uh, clean and sober? So it's it's a very solution focused approach. Here's a question that I was going to ask uh, from Fatima: Is it a is a talking piece used? Is it? I mean, are you using the circle process with a talking piece one at a time, or does everybody speak? How, how does what's the mechanic? People speak one at a time. And no, we don't use a talking piece. We don't use a talking piece. And 
we've never had any problem with people speaking one at a time. We do sit at the beginning of the process, that's our only two ground rules, we say. The only two rules we have for this process are that people speak one at a time and that we, uh, we respect confidentiality law. And that's how we say it. And uh, yeah, we've never had a problem with using, with people talking at once. People have always, in the hundreds of people that have done this, we set the stage, I think, because when they come in, it's very respectful and, um, yeah, it's, we've never had to use the talking piece. Yeah, it's always been good. The only time, maybe sometimes people during the, when we do the strengths, sometimes maybe a auntie or somebody will, instead of strengths, they'll be saying the complaints, <laughs> you know, what they don't like about the person. You know, everyone, I, I was thankful that uh, my family was there they weren't there to bash me and I was kind of afraid of that that's why I, the, mm -hmm. as, as Lauren and navigated through what, what I was doing what, what why I was there it was so great I was so grateful and thankful that, that the healing could start and forgiveness was not granted and, and I know it'll work for people yeah and yeah. um, so yeah when and so if somebody does start saying a lot of complaints about the person then we just ask Oh, okay, and what do you like about him? What are the good things about him? What, you know, maybe if they talk about, oh, he blah, 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 something. Now you, we go back to the history, you know, when they were little, like, what did you like about him when he was little? What were the good things? So we get that that way. But um, yeah, we've never had any problem with people um, interrupting or fighting or anything like that ever, never, no, never. Here's a couple more questions. This is out of order, but a couple more questions related to the circle process itself. We got a lot of questions coming. This is good. Um, one of them is, where did you, who shared with you the wisdom of circle? Does this connect with traditional Hawaiian? Did, I don't know. I never knew how to pronounce the word properly, so I'm not going to. Ho'oponopono. That's Ho -ho is the Hawaiian uh, circle process for uh, that families and, and, and in fact, my first experience with Ho'oponopono was when I was a deputy attorney general, I had to write a, a attorney general opinion on the <laughs> if a ho'oponopono process had to be uh, open meet was an open meeting for purposes of the um, Office of Hawaiian Affairs here. And actually, we're really sensitive in Hawaii to um, I'm a what we call mainland Haole. I, uh, white people are called Haole in Hawaii, and um, I'm not Hawaiian, and so I don't. It was just a, been a couple years even that I was told that it's okay by some Hawaiian kahus, which are people who are, um, they are cultural experts, native Hawaiian people. And, um, but I didn't even want to say that it was, uh, um, it's really our process is based on public health learning principles. All native um, indigenous people, Peter Senge in a book, that William Isaacs wrote about dialogue. He, Peter Senge says that all indigenous cultures have some kind of talking circles. And ours is not based, it is not a, um, we, I didn't try to, to um, you know, think that I was a native Hawaiian cultural expert and apply any, any aspects of Ho'oponopono. I've taken Ho'oponopono training but I am not, um, I'm not qualified at all to, uh, to, to apply those aspects of it. You know, I'm, we're, we're really respectful of the Native Hawaiian tradition. And I leave that to my um, Native Hawaiian colleagues to uh, describe and do. It's, it's really a different process. Ho'oponopono is, is very different. I mean, it's a talking circle like this is and like, like all uh, peoples have, I think. But you I hope that Sorry. Me? Ian, do you want to add anything to that before we move on? What, what, what I, my understanding of Pono Pono growing up is a deep, sincere uh, forgiveness, and it's very similar to what Lauren is doing. The very, it affects people really deep in the heart. You know, Hawaiian people are like that. They're very, very loving. And when you hurt something, and you, we got to fix that. Mm -hmm. And it, there's a way to fix that. And it's very similar to what we're doing. And, and we're spiritual. And 
and that's what I experienced uh, a bit while with my therapeutic community. And uh, to this day, I'm just a bright star right now. Every day of my life, I never forget this. Uh, I'm here to help any way I can. And um, Hawaiian, okay. Native Hawaiian people who have had the circle have said, oh, yeah, the, it's like Ho'oponopono. But I don't say that. I'm just saying that, that other people can say that who are Native Hawaiian, but I can't say that. Um, and it's not. When, when we developed the process, we didn't go look at Ho'oponopono and say, okay, we're going to apply this and that. Uh, we really looked at public health, solution-focused um, principles. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Sorry. Um, uh, but yeah, Hawaiians do. It, one really beautiful thing about uh, Hawaiian people is, and um, I think a lot of Pacific Islanders, is a, uh, a real deep sincerity and genuine heartfelt. And, and you know, all, all, I think all people have this. Want, we want to cooperate. We want when something bad happens, we we don't we don't want to leave it like that. We want to have cooperation and um, uh, love. You know, I think humans are driven by love way more than um, violence and um, fighting. We're more driven by love and uh, cooperation. So, um, yeah. As Kate Brannis often says, you're asking people to draw on their better, better self. Uh, yeah. Better yeah. part of themselves. Here's two questions that are related, so I will ask them both. Uh, how soon before a person is going to be released from incarceration do you start a reentry circle? Is there a time that you would consider too soon? And kind of related to that is when is the offender or the prisoner initially approached with this program? Is the program introduced to the entire population of the prison? Are they asked? Are they asked uh, during that what portion of their term of their incarceration in their prison during the midterm for the end? So, you get the questions there. Yeah, the, you, um, the we them? actually I would do this right at conviction. You know, right when someone's convicted, I would do this process because it helps you make a plan for how you're going to live a positive life and try to repair harm that's been caused. And it's the way it's introduced and um, really people, it's kind of by word of mouth. They, uh, if they take our, this cognitive behavioral class that we do, this 12 week class, they learn about it during the circle in the, in that class. We do this, we actually develop this process called a modified reentry circle that we do in this course. And it's, we've done them too with other people outside of prison. And it's instead of having your loved ones there, you have the other people who are also in the course with you, sit with you and do it. We actually designed it in Ian's class, the, the first class we did 10 years ago. And it was really successful. One of the guys who had one, he decided to repair the harm. He was going to write a letter to his girlfriend's grandmother, an apology letter. And so he did write the apology letter and then the next week he came back, we came back to the class and he had this, he was so happy oh. beaming and his, um, his mother who he had been estranged from for like five years had written him a letter because the grandmother had called her up and said, listen to this letter I got from him. He's changed. And the, then the mother was like, wow, you know, wanted to contact her son. And so she did, she contacted him. And then, um, six months later, I wrote about this in a paper. He, the man was going to live with his mom. He's going to, he's being released from work furlough to his mom's house. So, but I think it can be the earlier, the better. I, you know, as long as someone is, um, you know, account, wants to do this, they want to um, make amends, they want to make a plan. I think any time is fine. But what we do, because we are limited in our resources and how many we can do, if somebody is going to get out sooner, we'll just make, it's like kind of like a triage decision-making. We'll do the person who's going to get out sooner, you know, so that they have something planned, like how to get, you know, all these needs. So for, for everyone, for me, it was about, it's called a TPD, a temporary parole date. And you look forward to that, your whole incarceration period, their date, mine was in uh, August. 
prior to that, I, I took the classes from learning. I got introduced to learn about uh, about three months, three or four months, <clears throat> once a week in the evening. And you go to class and you know, plans of, seeds are planted and you learn and learn. There's a lot of learning to do. And my friends ask me, what are you doing? What is that? Probably, Ian, what is that? Oh, I'm doing this. Oh, really? And you, know, you, you share that with your friendship. With your, with your friends in there, my friends, I live with them, yeah, my brothers, yeah, and in the therapeutic community, it was separated from the prison, and um, that was good for me, uh, three or four months prior to my temporary, pro, uh, my parole hearing. So, that's, yeah, so then they hear about it from other people oh, having a Yeah, word of mouth, everybody yeah. knows what's going on, and yeah, that's the way it is, it's tied, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, and it, that's how it is, and you know, we're, we're in a separate community, so the thinking, we're learning all kinds of stuff in there. Everybody's thinking whether they like it or not. You're, you're going to open up to something. You're going to get some reasoning in there at wherever level you're at. And, and, and I'm going to share it with everybody. You know, I was a good leader in there. And, uh, but really initially, fun. when we first introduced it to a prison, we've gone in and just done a presentation. And the people, the staff at the prison have just told people who are imprisoned, oh, there's going to be a uh, talk about restorative justice, this uh, process, and that's how we've initially gone into prisons, to new prisons that way, and done a presentation. So when I was, everyone, when I was there, I think our class had like 12 people. It started with a little bit, and I, I remember, to, yeah, and then they started growing because you, you, you come back and they, hey, what are you doing, Ian? Oh, I'm going to come check it out. Check this out, man. We're going to get out pretty soon. Man, you want to make things right? Let's just check this out, man. We're not going to do what we did before. Yeah, it's, to some, it's going to help a lot. A lot of, it helps a lot of people. We still in contact with today. Yeah. Still got the love in there. Yeah. We're getting a lot of very positive responses here. And Leanne, in, who's a PhD candidate in Birmingham, UK, says, thank you for this, having this seminar. Already very useful and thought provoking. Have the reentry planning circles been used for a range of crimes? Is there a limitation based on the severity of crime? No, it's been used for a range of crimes. We don't discriminate about crimes. The, you know, various, various murder. We've had several. A lot of drug offenses, though. Most of the crimes are drug-related offenses. Well, there's that question just came in that's really I mean they're just piling in here this is great uh, somebody says with regard to safety and protection of everyone involved in the circle is the person in prison or the quote offender allowed to be without restraints during the process are there yes. some guards yes. in the room Never. yeah no there's no restraints okay no restraints I think that takes care of that question um, Somebody here is asking, what, you talked about relapse and what number they think won't. What type of support is given upon release uh, into the community? And there's several people asking that. The particular question asked of this is a friend of mine who has been in prison for a long time. Uh, so he, he knows what he's talking about here. But, uh, what what, well, what do you say about that? We, we leave during the circle. That's addressed. People make a plan for how they're going to deal with their, with their staying clean and sober. What do they need to do? It's really, that's where it's the very Montessori public health solution focused. It's put on the people how to make that. How do you get that? Um, how do you get those resources? What can you do? How can you, how can you find this information? How can you find support and help? Um, yeah, we don't have, we just facilitate the process and set a stage for the people to make a plan themselves, make their own relapse prevention plan. A lot of times people bring counselors to their counselors come to the circle. Oh, yeah. A lot of the, they come, the, the counselors come and then they, they're part of it. They can make suggestions. And um, when we do the plan, we're really concrete. You know, we're like, okay, when are you going to write this letter? What day are you going to write yes. this letter by? When, when we talk about emotional health, a lot of times people say they're going to do exercise to maintain good emotional health. And, and we ask them, how much, what kind of exercise? Run? Okay, you're going to run. How much are you going to run? How long are you going to run? How many days a week? It's very precise. And the plan is they end up with a written plan that's about six to eight pages long, really detailed with all this information. And 
the people that we've met with over the years now who've had them are so always tell me, Lauren, I did all the things in my plan. You know, they did all the, they accomplished all the things they said. And in New Zealand and family group models, part of the written agreement is who's going to monitor the various things and hold people accountable. Yes, that can be built in. It's up to the people. If that is that's something that they want to have, then they say that, and then that is designated. And we've done another thing we've done is um, for adults and also for youth who are going to live at home, go back home. And we started it with the adults, adult men who are going to go live at home. We They said, um, well, what was, was there going to be any rules about him coming home? Is he going to pay rent? Is he going to do work? And the, the and we've done um, the family, we have facilitated and helped them develop a behavior like a behavioral contract. And I've heard from people that they posted these on the refrigerator and how great it was because he mowed the lawn every two days or every, you know, twice a month and did all this stuff and was going to cook or you know, walk the dog, all kinds of stuff. It was, um, but yeah, it's up to the people though, what they need. We really respect the people to, um, to come up with, uh, with the alternatives and, uh, um, what's going to work for them. The fact that you're making these commitments in a, in a community of people probably helps the motivation to actually follow. Yeah. Through. Yeah, and having witnesses. You have witnesses. witnesses uh, circle of witnesses. Somebody here is asking, do you feel like you're doing the work that corrections ought to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It's not really corrections. Sometimes it's just punishment. It's just blaming and punishment system. But yeah, you know, we're trying to... And actually, what's been really nice about this, too, we've sometimes... and Well, what's happened is that um, the people in the, who work in the prisons have told me that they have noticed when people have these circles, their behavior is so good. And, um, and we have our cognitive behavioral class. I know Larson Medina at the women's prison here tells me, he goes, Lauren, that dorm is wonderful because they're having your class. And they, you know, they, because they're focusing on cooperation and how to get along and accept that you're not going to always get what you want, and how do you deal with that? But a couple of people are asking: Do you have statistical data regarding ethnicity and race, demographic, demographic, demographic? And if so, is there certain groups that are more likely to un or more more unwilling to join these than others? Is there any pattern there? Well, I can. The native Polynesian people really like this, but we've had all. Uh, people do Hawaii is interesting. Hawaii, we have the least amount of white people in the United States. We have the least, we only have about 24% Haole white people live in Hawaii, only 25 or 24%. And so it is people, all people, mostly people of color. And um, we do have disproportionate share of Native Hawaiians in prison. And um, I'm sorry, right off the top of my head, I can't tell you exactly what the statistics are. We're doing some research right now, though, and we will look at that. Do you have, have, have Go ahead. In the sorry. circle, do, do young children participate sometimes? Yes. Seven-year-old, or I mean, can they? Yes. They yes, we've had seven-year-olds, three-year-olds. Yeah, we've had all ages. People have brought little babies with them. It be very valuable. Yeah, and we have, um, for other little kids, we have, like, yeah, it's real positive. Yeah. yeah, it's very positive, and they, um, they, yeah, two teenage girls, I remember, who had one. They were about 12 and 9 or something, and we um, maintained contact with their mom for years, like, um, in the last 10 years, and the girls, their dad, it was really interesting because we had an observer at that circle who was a... Um, a social worker who worked for the prison department and she um, she was uh, suspicious of the process anyway she actually she wrote a good thing about it but then later on she said you know she thought that um, those two kids had been uh, re-victimized and so I went back and talked to the mother uh, of the kids and the mother because the father as soon as the kids came in and the father was there the father immediately said Oh, please forgive me. It all became about him, wow. you know. And um, so, 
so this woman observing it didn't like that at all, but the circle itself was really positive. But anyway, so I talked to the mom about the girls later, and then we also did include, we talked to the girls later, and they're, uh, we talk, they're, they're discussed in a paper we just published on the benefits of this for children of incarcerated parents. And these girls, it was really interesting, their mom, she said, oh yeah, my, hus my ex-husband did act all narcissistic, that's how he is. And then this is like, this is like a few years later, right? And she said, and I said, well, how was that for the girls? You know, I was addressing what this observer who didn't like the process said. And um, the mom told me, she said, it's great. She, they, what it was, they saw in their dad, they noticed these red flags in his behavior. And that now the girls, they were like, now when I talked to her, I guess they were about 16 or something, they were starting to date. And she said that the girls would say, you know, um, to each other, oh, you shouldn't like him. He's like dad. And they would, um, you know, they learned from that. They learned what they, uh, or deficits of their father and not to, you know, to um, date men that had those similar characteristics. So it was really interesting. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, they learned awesome. and... As you probably know, I co-authored a book of photographs and interviews with children who have parents in prison. And this this kind of process would be so helpful to those kids. I can just imagine how eager they would be for something. Yeah, like that. yeah. Uh, and more questions about the circle itself. This is so powerful, Lon says. It is like you're giving invitations to take responsibility and carefully building up support and caring with your questions. Can you share some more questions you, you use in the circle to do this? Any other specific questions that you? Um, yes, actually, and um, I have cited Alan Jenkins' work. He's from Australia, he's a narrative psychologist, and Alan Jenkins wrote this great book, I love it, it's called Invitation to Responsibility, and he works with uh, violent sex offenders, and um, it talks about the language, how we do use language, this invitation to responsibility, um, language that grounds people in positive um in positive behavior and thought and so the way i found out about this actually the solution focused stuff was um uh, we had we were doing restorative conferencing with people who admitted to crimes and we were going to their houses and doing it's diane stoloi the uh, therapist oh doing these restorative conferences with their families. And one father was, um, he had been pushed by his adult son, had a head injury. The son was, um, you know, charged with assault in court and um, decided he wanted to have this uh, restorative conference in the family home with the family and they wanted to. And so the dad had a drinking problem. He was like really drunk when the son pushed him. And um, so I asked, this is before I knew about the solution focus thing, and I said, I asked him, well, why do you drink so much? Because I thought that would be helpful for him to know his motivation, you know, and then he could change. He'd see a light, you know, and change, right? And then he did He just laughed and it didn't, the question didn't work. But I, then the next day, the very next day, I talked to my friend, Gail Burford, who is a, a social work professor. He's retired now and does restorative justice. He did the Newfoundland um circles power you know right. about that okay oh yeah john, yeah john pinnell and he and howard i mean um gail when i told gail about that question of the drunk the father who had the drinking problem he said oh lauren you should have asked a solution focused question which would have been some it would have been something like oh well um sir if you if you stop drinking like your wife and your family here want you to they um how would that be for you or um, when, when don't you drink so much? You know, when don't you drink? One of the times you're not drinking. So the solution focus questions, there's a lot of them. They really focus on exceptions to problems. When does the problem not happen? And um, it focuses on your accomplishments, the things that you have accomplished, the solutions and just generating more of that. It's, and we also say, what else? What else? We always say that. What else? When someone says, oh, when I, I don't drink when I'm out, when I'm at my parents' house. Okay, when else don't you drink? You know, we get people to think yeah. of uh, 
always generate as many alternatives as possible. There's a lot of stuff written about solution-focused brief therapy. In fact, next month, I'm going to give a talk at the Solution-Focused Brief Therapy Conference in um, Wilmington, North Carolina. In Wilmington, North Carolina, they're having a big conference, and um, I'm going to talk there. But it's uh, there's a lot on that. Uh, and Penny Griffith, too, in Washington, D.C., she also uses a lot of solution folk. That's how she and I started working together, because Insu Kimberg was her teacher, too. And Insu introduced us. She knew we were both doing restorative justice work and were interested in the solution focus stuff. And it is a lot of questions. And that's the hardest thing in teaching facilitators. Learning this, the hardest thing is to be solution focused because our culture is very deficit based. We're really bombarded with negativity all the time, you know, about what we don't like, you know, what's wrong, um, to think of what's right and um, be grateful and how do you get more of what's good is um, that's the challenge is to stay in that kind of a mindset. But it's a really good, it's a great. It's a great way to practice. Somebody's asking while we're talking about is action learning model used at all during the circles? Do you know what that is? No, I'm not sure what it is. It action learning? Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Is it like a capitalized? Um, but I don't inactive, know. Inactive learning because it is inactive. Montessori, Albert Bandura, inactive learning where people participate in it. Okay. Uh, do you find that the reaction to the circle the same in different places, Hawaii, New York, California? Yes, I um, I found yes, and actually I've trained these in these I've trained people to, for these circles in Tokyo, uh, Spain, um, Finland. Uh, where else? I can't remember where else. And um, it's all it's been very positive. Yeah. The, um, the Japanese really, in Tokyo, they really liked it. It was a solution focus. It was mostly therapists who do solution-focused brief therapy in Tokyo, and uh, they really liked it. It was actually when I did that training last year, I um, it was so, I had to come. I was in Spain, and I flew to, to Tokyo, and it was the day before the biggest snowstorm in 60 years. And all of the therapists, there was like 25 of them, they all came despite the snow. And they all came the second day. Um, yeah, it was amazing. They really liked it. So, yeah, I found people, you know, I think humans, all humans, and also the woman we did the circle for in Finland, we did, because we've done real circles in these places. The woman in Finland, she was from Africa. I think she was from Nigeria. And um, she really liked it. But I think all humans, we're all, we all want to cooperate. We all want to get along. And so... This model and, and, and restorative justice is about cooperation and trying to get along and repair things. I, that's why I think restorative justice is, it is a solution-focused approach because it's about what you do want. You know, instead of the bad, sad thing that happened, the harm, how can we make things right? Which in Hawaiian, we call that pono. Pono is um, right have a little right. connection problem right now. Me, how do we think right? Mm -mm. We had just a little bit of connection. Oops, we can't hear you. Very well. But you're back. Sorry. So, yeah. I would think though there'd be some cultural adaptation that would need to happen. Certainly the greetings. I mean, in New Zealand. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm not saying there's not cultural right. adapt. Of course there is, and people they have their own names and do. Yeah. Yeah. No, people do um, do adapt it and call it something. You know, it's it's. I just think it's um, humans have group process. You know, they have. We have these circle. We do talk to each other and um, sit in circles, and it's been around forever. You know, even Westerners, right? Did it? Even Westerners, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's a uh, couple questions here. Did you ever have a convicted sex offender as a participant? How is that person able to be effective when he apologized to his friends and family? Are there therapies? Sorry, it's kind of freaking out. Sorry. Can I start over? Is it connected? Do you ever have a connect, convicted sex offender be a participant? If so, how is that person able to be effective when he or she, when he apologizes to his friends and family? Are there therapy sessions? Right. Um, uh, yeah. 
Um, we, you know what? We, um, I don't think we have had people convicted for sex. If, I'm not sure if we have had, um, I don't really remember. I mean, we have done work with people in our court project who were, um, they were convicted for some kind of a sex offense. But um, in these re-entry circles, I'm, I'm sure people have had it. And well, you know what, we leave it to the prison too. The prison sends us the applications. So we leave it up to the, you know, the prison has some responsibility in choosing, you know, whose applications they're gonna forward to us. Um, there was one time we did have a guy, I remember a guy I did interview and I had like an intuitive, I don't know, I felt uncomfortable. The guy only wanted to meet with this woman and it was, I remember now, it was a sex offense. And um, I just didn't process the case. I didn't do the circle. I didn't go the next step in it, which was, I think I was gonna have to write her a letter. She lived on Molokai, I was in, um, she, he didn't have her phone number, um, but yeah. So we didn't, I didn't have that guy's circle. I mean, I think you could use this with people and I would want to have more, you know, expert therapist people involved that were, um, you know, had more experience in that area. So there's another, this is, this has caused another question to come up here and that is, can you compare this to the COSA, the circles of support and accountability that have been, they were developed first for sex offenders, but now they're being used for other kinds of reentry. And how does your process, in what way is it similar? In what ways is it different? In COSA? Um, can you remind me? Yeah, I've read about that, but I now I right now at the moment, I forget, Howard, what was, what is that model, the COSA? It's called circles of support and accountability. Uh -huh. and that, is, and that is not just a planning circle, it's a continuous circle for quite some time where you you hold it, you you provide support but also is it the it. hollow creek is that that's the hollow creek right is that the native american native? no it came out of canada but it wasn't i mean they did work with sex offenders but it, the model came out of i think kitchener uh -huh. or toronto originally right uh, all right if you don't know the answer we can go on to some others here but. yeah sorry i'm not i'm not really sure right at this moment well, I think one way would be that the COSAs are long-term meeting like once a week and members of that may be in, uh -huh. in, in, in contact with the person daily for a while and so forth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. More intensive. Yeah. Uh, more, more therapeutic. It's uh, I think more therapeutic, right? Well, maybe, but also more focus on, on daily accountability. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. okay. Um, how long does it usually take from the time the inmate is approached until the actual meeting in the circle? Is there any pattern to that? Um, well, it really depends. It's kind of driven by what the person's needs are. You know, if they're going to get out, if they're looking to what we call max out, you know, they're going to get out of prison like in three months, we'll try to have one, you know, within the three months. But um, right now we're pretty much just strapped for resources. Yeah. You know, it's really, we don't do at all the number that the people want. And um, yeah. Here's a, a longer question that came in earlier. Uh, David said, Lauren, we once had contact regarding a circle for persons coming up to parole and having the circle serve as a kind of practice parole hearing where uh, uh, imprisoned persons could play a role, could role play, I guess, parole members and so forth, all with the hope of leading that person in questions to build a better plan. And Wexler, my friend, Pictures, a good friend of mine, uh, yes, David. Um, yes, we do, um, what we do is um, in our, that cognitive behavioral class, David Wexler had the really good idea of um, how people could um, practice parole presentations, presentations to parole boards, and we do do that. And we do a restorative justice as a solution focused approach to conflict and wrongdoing. And we have people weekly do, they do a mock parole presentation. It's really powerful. The other people, yeah, it's very, yeah, that's very helpful. Okay, here's a, the first question that came in is a big question. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for me. So um, I'm hoping to learn some things about community justice as I'm 
proposal to bring the idea before our community leaders. Uh, I'm going to make this short. Uh, I'm considering how to integrate this into an entrepreneurial model of justice as well. Mainly, she's asking, how do you start and promote these kind of programs in a community that really doesn't have anything like it and is really very retribution oriented? Well, I would try, yeah. Um, well, I first learned about restorative justice 20 years ago, about 1995, and I. Um, have tried to apply it. We have tried to apply it across the spectrum, you know, schools, public housing communities, courts, prisons, parole, probation, wherever there is an interest. And it's just a matter of finding individuals in who work in those systems to get them interested in it. And then doing something, doing a pilot, we just do pilot projects, our organization, Although this prison project's been a 10-year pilot project, they, they see it. We should do it, and then they see it. And then when people observe it, because it's really hard to explain what happens in a circle. It's, you kind of have to see You have to see it yeah. and experience yeah. it. And that's the power of it. That's why I think it helps people. That's how people learn is by participating. I would, if I was in a new community, I would just go talk to people like probation officers or wherever you wanted to target and um, see uh, schools. I think schools are really ripe. I really like the work um, Fania Davis is doing in um, Oakland in the schools. It's, it's really awesome, her uh, reentry work she's doing. Well, I spent about 20 years helping communities start programs, and that's pretty much the way it works. You find a few interested people to find a there's, every system has people in who are disillusioned with what they're doing. Find some of those people and start a pilot project that is very much like that. Absolutely, yeah. The same, I agree, Howard. Yep. Well, we're wrap, it's getting to wrap up here. Um, do you have anything else you want to make sure we cover before we turn this over to Jordan to talk to tell us about what's coming up? Um, I Can think you that's, you know, I'm happy just to help anybody who has any questions, email me or, you know, we have a lot of papers, um, you know, yeah, anything we can do to help anybody, we're, um, we're always happy to help anyone. And um, I just want to thank my friend Ian for coming and um, doing this and for all your good work, Ian. And um, we had a really nice thing last night in our um, state Supreme Court, we have a a parole completion celebration that was just beautiful. Our Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald uh, was there and a bunch of other um, people getting off parole and their loved ones. We all sat and we sit in a huge circle. It's our seventh one. And um, first we have some food and music and then we go up and have this giant circle. It's in the room right next to our Supreme Court. And, Over 100 people. Yeah, it's so beautiful. So we had that last night. It was really nice. But I think ritual, I think that's important to just note that all these circles and um, processes, it's really ritual. You know, it's the ritual of, of um, welcoming the community, the ritual of um, acknowledging people. And that's another thing is because we are trying to make our systems improve them and make them better make the parole system better. And so we give awards to people for good behavior, for good parole officer work, good probation officer work. And instead of just complaining about people and saying what a bad, what bad work they do, it's better to say, oh, well, who are the people doing the good work? Let's point them, you know, let's do a solution. That's what solution focused approach is about. It's about finding the good things and getting more of that instead of just complaining, you know, about all the bad things. So um, I think just remembering that and then having those kind of positive rituals. And um, my friend Shad Maruna, it, um, he's at Rutgers now in the criminology. He's the yeah. dean of the criminology school at, in Newark. He's, um, he's really into that too. And John Braithwaite, you know. And so, yeah, I think the idea of ritual is really important. And this paper we just wrote too, we talked, well, I found this research on primates on primate rituals, it's really interesting. When they, when primates uh, make amends, they make amends. And they do think they have, they have rituals that they engage in. It's really fascinating, fascinating. So I think that we, um, these kind of processes are that too. So, okay.
Sorry, I talked. Okay, thank you all very much. If anybody has any questions, thanks a million, Howard. Well, now we'll we'll put this. It'll be, it'll be recorded on our website, and there's been questions asked here. Will you make your PowerPoint available on the website? Are you? Yes, sure. I'll put it. Yeah, you, you can have it. Okay, so website. that'll be available, and any other resources you want to post there, because I think there's going to be a lot of follow-up interest in this. Well, thank you so much. Okay. It's been very. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, it's been a lot of interest in it. So, really appreciate you doing this. Jordan, we'll turn it over to you now to wrap up here. Great. Well, welcome everyone, and welcome myself back to the webinar. Uh, my name is Jordan Detweiler Michelson, and I'm currently a graduate student at the Center for Justice and Peace Building in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I'm currently the graduate assistant to the uh, Zare Institute for Restorative Justice, and just have a couple of announcements to share. Uh, regarding the Zare Institute and upcoming events. Uh, the Zare Institute for Restorative Justice is a center whose goal is to spread knowledge about restorative justice and be a resource to practitioners who are in the field. We do this by facilitating conversations and cultivating connections through activities like conferences and webinars. Um, we are offering space to explore frontier topics like the intersection of arts and peace building and the ways that trauma and restorative justice are connected. If you enjoyed today's webinar and want to stay involved in these discussions that we are carrying forward, discussions on other topics as well, then I would invite you to, to stay tuned and check out our website for the exciting lineup of RJ webinars that we have this fall. Uh, just real briefly, in November, our webinar will be with Johanna Turner who will be speaking about youth leadership for restorative justice. In December, we will be joined by Lauren Abramson, and she'll be talking about lessons from 18 years of community and uh, community conferencing and restorative practices uh, from her work in Baltimore. And in February, we will be joined by David Karp and Karen Williamson on restorative approaches to sexual assault on college campuses. All of these webinars take place on Wednesdays at 4.30 p.m. EST. Some more information about the Zare Institute. We are part of the Center for Justice and Peace Building in Eastern Mennonite University, which is located in Harrisonburg, Virginia. EMU offers undergraduate degrees and several graduate programs, such as the Masters in Conflict Transformation, business administration, counseling, biomedicine, and education. EMU also has a seminary program and is the host of the Summer Peacebuilding Institute, and you can learn about all of our programs online at emu.edu. The Summer Peacebuilding Institute uh, is available for registration. There are two classes uh, that have particular interest or connections to restorative justice. Uh, Foundations for Restorative Justice will be a class taught by Lorraine stutzman Amstutz and Johanna Turner. And Truth-Telling, Reconciliation, and Restorative Justice will be taught by Carl Stoffer and Fania Davis. Uh, these two classes will be uh, very, very exciting, very informative, um, both for going deeper in the, the concepts and practices of restorative justice and their applications in different contexts uh, that we are facing today. So please check out the website for these courses and for the full course listing um, that can be found online as well. A, a quick note about STAR, which is the Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. It's a research-based training program that began in 2001 and the training brings together theory and practices from neurobiology conflict transformation, human security, spirituality, and restorative justice to address the needs of trauma-impacted individuals and communities. And this program is great for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. And there are several opportunities to receive STAR training, as is listed here on the screen. There are two levels of training. Level one introduces participants to the, the STAR training materials and, and the trauma healing framework. And level two offers um, 
an opportunity for participants to go deeper with their own practices and, and the connections that they have in their work settings and in their communities. Uh, there are several opportunities to receive STAR training. I would encourage you to, to look at the website and, and sign up for one of these trainings if you are interested. A quick note about the Masters in Conflict Transformation. It is a practice-based curriculum that explores nonviolent and restorative responses to conflict. Uh, students are allowed to, to focus on a, a variety of practices and areas, including restorative justice, psychosocial trauma, and strategic peace building. Uh, information about that program can be found online at emu.edu um, and search for CJP. We are also very excited to be offering a restorative justice graduate certificate, which allows working professionals to continue uh, working in their field and also supplement their working experiences with, with studies, um, reflecting on work experience and increasing your knowledge and skills in the field of restorative justice. I know in the past that we've offered at least one of these courses online to allow students to, to beam in through this technology and, and join us uh, from wherever they may be. Um, so please stay tuned and look for opportunities if you have interest in, in pursuing that uh, sort of training or that sort of um, certificate program. We are also offering a restorative justice in education program. And this is being offered through the MA in Education program here at EMU. There are two different ways to, to pursue this. Uh, students in the full MA program can elect an RJ in education concentration. And it's a very interdisciplinary approach. Um, and you take some classes with the education program and some classes with CJP. And we, uh, that program is also offering a 15 hour graduate certificate program in restorative justice in education. So many ways to, to uh, deepen knowledge and, and approaches and, and theories and practice in restorative justice. Um, if you or someone that you know has interest in these fields, then I would encourage you to, to come back and, and check out these programs. Um, lastly, stay tuned with our new website. Uh, we are very excited about this and, and come here often for updates on webinars, get connected and, and learn about what other events uh, we're hosting or facilitating. Um, and that takes care of our announcements for today. With that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Howard, who will, will close our session for us. Yes, thank you again for attending. And we will have in the, in the, uh, in the winter and spring, we will have at least monthly uh, webinars again. We haven't filled that whole schedule out yet and if you have suggestions about what covers the topics you'd like us to cover or guests that we should have on here feel free to send them to us uh, we'll be happy to to consider that so thank you again and lauren and ian thanks so much for being with us and i hope you aren't overwhelmed with questions but i appreciate your willingness to, to take take questions and answer emails thank you again and uh have a good evening all thank you bye 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 bye, -bye. Nope. Thank you.